Hi, I'm Guy Wallace, and this is the third video in a series I'm calling Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development with your host, Guy Wallace. We could also call this series of videos the Insomnia Solution. Not my insomnia, yours. Just kidding. In this series, I'm covering some of my adventures from the past four decades that I've spent in performance-based training and development. This video covers the years 1997 through 2002, and my work at the firm that I started after I left Ray Svensson, CADI, the Curriculum Architecture Design and Development Institute, Incorporated. We were in the western suburbs of Chicago. I'll start with talking about some of my consulting projects of interest. Um, I, I had a bunch. Uh, I worked for General Motors uh, and at CADI, we were continuing the work that we were doing with our packed processes technology transfer to the General Motors uh, instructional design community and their uh, local suppliers and national suppliers that they were using. So we were training their staff and their vendor community uh, in our methodologies. And as I explained in the last video, they had converted my methodology for CAD, Curriculum Architecture Design, to what they wanted to call Modular Curriculum, MC. And we also took my ADDI level of ISD, uh, which I call MCD, Modular Curriculum Development and Acquisition, and they converted that into MI, Modular Instruction. Good names, but it was an unnecessary effort, uh, as I explained in the last video. But uh, I continued that project that started in 95, uh, we went to up until 2000. As part of that uh, effort, I did a whole bunch of CADs for them. Uh, a couple of note were the Tool and Die Supervisors Curriculum Architecture Design and Modular Curriculum, so MC and followed by quickly by an MI effort. This was uh, a project that won the General Motors Chairman Award, uh, the General Motors Quality Award in 98. The project was done in 97. It was my 60th performance-based curriculum architecture design project since 1982 as a consultant. The uh, effort was uh, basically because what General Motors was finding in their metal fab area where they punch out the uh, body panels for cars, etc., was that uh, when they were promoting from within the ranks, the hourly workers and making some of them supervisors, what they were finding is that those supervisors tended to not manage very well or discipline at all their former peer group. As they became the boss of their peers, that wasn't working out too well for General Motors and it was leading to all sorts of issues, union issues, etc. And so what the organization had decided to do was to go out and recruit new supervisors from technical schools across the country actually. And <clears throat> they had conceived of this idea of having an 18 month program where people would spend one week in class learning all about the job, how to do the job, and then one week, uh, followed by one week out on the f factory floors, the manufacturing facilities. And so that, so they had that idea, they had, they had actually gone out and recruited a whole bunch of people with the value proposition that that's what we're going to do for you, we're going to put you through this 18 month long thing. And then they came to my client, General Motors University, and said, help, we need to, we need to put this in place. And uh, <clears throat> so it was kind of a mad scramble to get this thing started. Um, but so what I did as part of the PAC process technology transfer, which involved taking the individuals that were gonna be trained and certified and having them observe the work being done by somebody who knows what they're doing, then going to training, and then being coached by somebody who'd already been certified as being able to go solo with these methodologies. So they would assist that person until that person that was already certified at a level three, able to solo, uh, would nominate them for being certified. And then somebody from my staff or the General Motors people that we were training and certifying, uh, they would go out and observe these people's performance through the course of the key activities, uh, conducting an analysis team meeting, conducting a curriculum architecture design meeting, or conducting a modular curricula, uh, modular instruction design meeting, as they were calling it. 
So I was brought in to do this. I convinced the client, my client and their internal client, to include some union representatives in the process. Well, two people showed up and they said, okay, we're not going to participate, we're going to observe. So we can report back to, you know, union leadership, you know, what the heck this is all about, if this is something they should be concerned with or not. And I wanted them there because I wanted them to know what, what we were really planning on conveying through the instruction later on, that this should be, you know, win-win. We're not trying to do anything to screw the union or whatever. So they participated as observers through both the curriculum architecture level analysis meeting, where we defined the chunks of the job, what I call areas of performance, major duties, key results areas, accomplishments. I've talked about that before in the earlier video about why I avoid those terms, but they're kind of an equivalent. But we chunked out what the job entailed, and then we, for each one of those chunks, identified all of the outputs produced by the performance of supervisors, and also then what tasks were associated to each and every output and we identified what the key measures were for each output and we understood we uh, also defined what are the various roles and responsibilities because a supervisor is dealing with their own management chain with the union and union stewards and with their people um, so we wanted to clarify what their role was in the context of this overall performance and then we did a gap analysis. So we, now that we understand what ideal performance could or should look like, not theoretical, but this is what actually is being done by master performers out there in the field, um, we were able to identify, so here are the problems that new people struggle with, which is really key and critical from my particular point of view. If you're gonna provide instruction, it's not the a easy, you know, this is as easy as ABC, one, two, three, you know, it's that simple. No, there's a whole bunch of barriers out there, uh, issues that, that performers have to deal with. And one of the things that we can do for them is not only teach them how to do the job from an ideal standpoint, but about these barriers. What do you do to avoid them in the first place? And if they're unavoidable, what do you do then? Master performers have strategies and tactics on how to avoid things and then how to deal with them if they were unavoidable. And so that's what the instruction has got to include. It's important to me and I've always included that and that makes sense to all my clients and they're happy that we actually address that and uh, of course it makes training a little bit longer than what everybody ideally wants at the beginning but when they see what performance is going to be addressed and how we're going to hone that performance through practice and feedback in the instruction they usually back off and let that happen and see you know how well that's going to work before they want to go in there with their carving knives and chop it up and, uh, and reduce the uh, amount of time necessary or that's actually spent. So that project was very interesting. I ran these meetings. Um, I, I ran the CAD level, architecture level. I did the, uh, the enabling knowledge and skills. We created a curriculum architecture design. So we mapped out this 18 month thing that was kind of the given, you know, no more, no less. And so we had half of that 18 uh, months. And so we had nine months worth of classroom training that we were gonna spec out. And this is important stuff because you know, if a supervisor is doing a poor job of managing their people, the people are doing a poor job of, man of managing their own work, of conducting that work, of punching out, you know, metal components that go into automobiles. And you can ruin tooling, which is very expensive to produce in the first place and expensive to replace, and it causes all sorts of schedule delays and such. And you can mess up a whole bunch of parts and produce a whole bunch of things that are going to be going in the scrap pile and then be recycled. And so, the stakes were pretty high for them in terms of what the cost of nonconformance was in the workplace then and there. And we needed to begin to address that and help them improve the overall situation. Um, so I, I went, went immediately from the CAD efforts into the MCD or what they called MI efforts and designed at the more micro level. So this is where I spec out training and development events, modular events, and the modules within an event are called lessons. And the lessons themselves are modular, and they're composed of what I call uh, instructional activities, which are one of three types, information, demonstration, and application. And we always design backwards. We always take the performance that we understand from the performance models, from the analysis data, and we articulate performance objectives, 
we call those instructional objectives and those are the uh, primary or terminal objectives and then there's enabling objectives which are usually well what you got to know to be able to do so the knowledge and skill enablers that we identified well those can be used to articulate the second level of learning objectives but we take that capture that in front of a group of people master performers so other subject matter experts uh, supervisors, sometimes novice performers, and in this case, some union stewards. Um, and we take the, that, that, uh, those objectives and we convert them immediately into application exercises. So we go from here's the objective, so how would people then in practice and with feedback, which the last one we could call a final test, what does that look like? Well, we want it to be authentic. We want it to look exactly or as close as possible to the real world work. So once we understand that, and we get a handle on should one practice and feedback session suffice or do we need two or three or four? Do we have to go from simple to a little bit more complex to real world complexity? You know, the application exercise from Hades, you know, is it got to be that hellacious just like the real world because that's what the real world is and we have to prepare people for that. So once we get that settled, we can ask the question of the master performers on our design team at that point. <coughs> Do we need to demonstrate that before we actually put people into these exercises? Should we demonstrate the exercise, the application exercise, before we ask them to do it? And the answer is either yes or no. And then we can talk about, well, what kind of demonstration do we need? Can we just, you know, use a video, the show, here's what you'll be doing in the exercise, and that is that sufficient? Or is the performance somewhat tricky? Are there points where decisions have to be made and we need to tease out and, and make overt the covert cognitive behaviors that people are using to actually perform? And so... My concept of a demonstration is that I can have a regular motion, full speed motion demonstration to show you this is what it looks like. Okay, now we need to maybe circle back to the beginning and slow it down or slow it down at certain points and show the trickier parts. And today we might use augmented reality uh, to label things and you know, this is what they're thinking. Put a little thought bubble over somebody's head and say, this is you know what, what decision they're trying to make. And here's the criteria that they're using to decide, you know, what, what's the appropriate decision out of the options that they have. And then we would take all the information about the knowledge and skills and decide, okay, what knowledge and skills need to go before the demonstration, before the application exercise. And so info, demo, apo. So what are the info chunks that we need? And we can decide, you know, how much information on this one topic or knowledge and skill item do we need the minimum amount in order to help make the demonstration make sense to actually prepare people to go in and do the application exercises which is where they're really going to learn how to do the job and so I was cranking out page flip chart page after flip chart page after flip chart page of these lesson maps of instructional activities just like a map of, you know, any country, it's got divisions in the United States. You know, we have a map of the United States, what's well, a map of the actual states. And every state map is of the counties or whatever that's called, uh, that varies across the United States. But anyway, so that's the equivalent. <clears throat> so we could actually have three levels of design. Here's the event, here's all the lessons within that event, and then here's all the instructional activities within all of those lessons. So I was producing those they were being ripped off the flip chart page, <clears throat> being posted on the wall so that we could do continuous referencing. Did, you know, we covered this earlier. Do we need to cover this a little bit deeper now, later on within the event or in a subsequent event? Because that happens too. And uh, the, I had people from the vendor community that were going to actually have to build this and put this in place. And, you know, it was starting in, you know, a matter of weeks. So it was really under the gun that we were doing this. And they were taking copious notes off of everything that was said in the meeting, capturing all the things that never make it to the page, the flip chart page, that the facilitator doesn't capture every last word. But they were trying to do that. And they were also then writing down everything that was going on to these lesson maps, which is the key device that I've been using since 1990 
I did it with a project uh, with Illinois Bell to, our, uh, to capture this kind of a format so I could use that kind of a format to capture data in my uh, facilitated group process. So anyway, so they were capturing everything and then running out of the room and then they would start development. And they were getting ready for the first delivery of this 18-month program. Um, it's, it was going to be, you know, a real delivery with real students in it, but it was a pilot session so we could, you know, take the evaluation from the student reactions, which you should all know that really don't mean much and we shouldn't react to that unless there's something that really stands out. But we could then take a look at well, how well were they performing on the job because they were spending a week in training and then a week on the job and then a week in training and a week on a job. So you could get pretty quick feedback about were they able to take what they had learned in the classroom and go out on the job and apply it successfully. And if not, what were the issues? And then the organization, the vendor community that was doing the, that actual development would, you know, go and tweak, revise the content for the next class that was coming. And they had a number of these classes they were going to be doing overlapping. Well, this was such a huge success that, again, it won the General Motors Chairman's Quality Award the next year because this had really been a significant effort, got a lot of attention because um, it was a new way of doing things and uh, my client at General Motors University used the their client uh, who was in charge of the project and some of the people from the metal fab department the organization that was in charge of all of this and some of their vendor community folks that were participants the ISD community that was participating in putting this thing together and they created a videotape because what we were finding, as I had been finding since I started all of this, resistance to the notion of jumping through all these hoops to really do a good job of articulating and capturing what is the performance requirements and anchoring everything to that. What are the enabling knowledge and skills? What's the instruction that we built with all that stuff? It all has to go back to that performance model because that's what we capture. That's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on teaching people how to do these tasks to produce these outputs to the measurement requirements, the stakeholder requirements, the downstream customer, the regulators, management, the finance community, everybody and their brother and sister that was concerned and had a stake in this performance. So, you know, what are their requirements we needed to understand? And then how do we meet them? How do we teach people to meet them? How do we provide them the instruction, whether it's group-based instruction or self-paced instruction or coached instruction? Um, but anyway, that was that project. It was a very cool project, and uh, 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 one of the people that uh, that I trained in the in the General Motors uh, vendor community on this, a woman named Kim Peterson, who is now Kim Som Somsky, uh, was a key critical person. And you'll see her on the video if you were to go look at that. It's a nine ten minute video. Uh, that's you can search for that on my website and and you'll find a link to it it's out on YouTube anyway um, <clears throat> other CAD projects that I did for General Motors and again this was all tied back to <clears throat> doing a demonstration project for the next cadre of people that were going to go through and be taught the methodology and then put out there with somebody else who'd already been certified to go solo so I did one for the global dealer auditors uh, and there were, you know, there was a guy who was flown in from Singapore to attend this three-day analysis meeting. And everybody else, the, my client's client, internal to General Motors, was saying, okay, this guy's not coming back from Singapore. He's not going to come here for a three-day meeting, go back to Singapore, and then the week after that, so two weeks after the first meeting, come back for another meeting. He's just not going to do that. Well, he showed up anyway, despite the fact that they were sure he wasn't going to, because, as he said, he invested all this time to help us get it right in the analysis thing. He wasn't going to let us screw it up in the design phase, so he wanted to be there. And his territory was Australia, and he was representing the, uh, I forget the auto dealer, people down under know what I'm talking about. It's the General Motors brand of cars down there. And uh, But anyway, so the job of the dealer auditors was to go around and do surprise inspections, <clears throat> kind of like I experienced in the military, in the Navy. Uh, surprise inspections to go through the uh, uh, dealers files and all their finances and what they were trying to do is protect the brand 
They didn't want any unscrupulous dealers to be taking a discount or a cash bonus that the factory, the manufacturer, was providing and put it in their own pocket. They wanted that passed on to the consumer because if the consumer that bought a car found out later on from somebody in their neighborhood that they should have been given a $500 or whatever the monetary unit is, if they didn't get that, then they were going to be angry, not at the dealer, but they were going to be angry at General Motors. And so these people were there to protect the interests of General Motors and protect the brand. And so they would go do these things. And so I learned a lot about the things that they knew to look for. They knew exactly how to go into the file systems, to look, what to look at first, second, and third to uncover any malfeasance on the part of dealers. And uh, I happened to use that with a... Uh, <clears throat> an auto dealer uh, when I ran into trouble uh, 10 15 years later I knew some of the tricks and I was able to suggest to the dealer that you know I'm I'm pretty sure the factory the manufacturer isn't going to be very happy with what you've done here because as I understand it blah 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 and <clears throat> they took care of me right away and gave me a loaner car and made me happier not happy but happier than I was when I started um, so that was a very interesting project as well. And then I did one for the MFD uh, area managers. So we went one step up. If this was good for the supervisors, let's do something for the managers. But there wasn't the same context. They weren't in a hurry. It wasn't something they had already promised and having people come on board expecting to have this 18-month program uh, in front of them. And so um, I did the design as a way to model all of this for the people that were going to learn how to do it. And then the vendor community, somebody in the vendor community took that project on and went ahead and did something with it, but I know not exactly what. I also did something for their internal controls group, same, similar kind of a thing where you're, you know, trying to make sure that we're staying square with the regulators and our own policies and procedures and not playing games with, you know, the money and things like that. And then I had a very interesting project with the brand managers of North America. And this was a new concept General Motors, you know, had come to the conclusion that, you know, if there's people who sell the br various brands of toothpaste and they really know how to market a brand. And so we were going to bring those people in here. Well, this was very controversial because, you know, if you didn't smell like gasoline or oil or have, you know, grease under your fingers here, you weren't really considered a ga uh, car guy or gal. Um, and you were uh, you know, you're immediately suspect. And so the brand managers that were being brought in to kind of change how General Motors did branding out there in the marketplace, you know, and deciding what was really important. And this is where you look at your competitors and what they're doing and what seems to appeal to the customers and why aren't you doing the same thing? And, you know, really trying to have an effect on the design community. You know, this is one of the places where I believe that they've discovered that, you know, 54% or something number like that of the car purchasing decision are made by women. Yet, who designs cars? Men. Who do the seats fit in cars? Men. You know, that ain't no good. <laughs> so, but they had come to this realization that they were really going to have to be attuned to the marketplace and who was making the purchasing decision and what was important to them and make sure that they were able to build that kind of features into the car and then tout those in their marketing so that they would sell more cars, you know, and take business away from the competition, etc. So that was a pretty interesting project. I learned a lot about uh, marketing and brand management from that project. And then, and then I was sent to Frankfurt, Germany to deal with the brand management, uh, General Motors brand management in Europe. And these were the people who, uh, dealt with the General Motors brand in Europe, which was Opel, the Opel car line. Um, and so that was a very interesting experience and got to see a little bit of Germany on the before and after uh, I went there. And uh, so, you know, sometimes you get to travel, sometimes you get to see the sites, most of the time you do not. So that was an unusual case here. I've been to a lot of very interesting places, but only saw them at night when my airplane landed and saw them as I left when my airplane took off in the night. And so I didn't really, I'd never been able to really do much uh, touristing kind of travel. Another uh, case study then from the uh, General Motors engineering <coughs> community, one of the people that I changed, this Kim that I talked about earlier, had this project where 
uh, General Motors wanted to take two jobs, a high-priced engineering job and a lower-priced, lower-salaried uh, technical job and create a job in the middle and move some of the more sophisticated tasks from the lower job and move some of the less sophisticated tasks from the higher paying job and move it into the middle job, a brand new thing. And they could unburden then high priced engineering talent from some of the mundane things that had to be done, but were a little bit more sophisticated and shouldn't be taken up by the hourly worker. I'm, I'm, I can't remember the details now about this. It wasn't my project, it was Kim's project. Anyway, she did this, she used our my packed process methodology for analysis. So what is the job? What are the outputs and the tasks between the two existing jobs? What are all the enabling knowledge and skills? Okay, and now let's, in the role responsibility area of the performance model, instead of having two columns or capturing, you know, who does what between these two jobs, let's put a third column in the middle of those two and decide which tasks could we move over into the middle column. And this was a project that took quite a while, as I recall. We wrote an article in one of our newsletters uh, in the business at the time. But um, so the, the finance organization within General Motors had calculated that this effort was projected to have a 360 to 1 ROI for the investment of half a million dollars. So if you do the math on that, you know, that's an $18 million return on your investment. So $18 million, so you spend a half a million to get 18 back. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, anyway, so that was one example of the use of these methods, this performance orientation, this performance focus for something other than instruction. And I think this, you know, my organization had done this, Ray Svensson and my wife at the time, Karen Wallace, and I had done that kind of work, and some of our staff had done that kind of work for our previous clients, and when, when General Motors heard about that, they thought, oh, this would be an, I, something we can use, and Kim was working with that engineering group, and she, I think she's the one who proposed this to them, and they bought into it, but it was still, you know, slogging your way through the bureaucracy of big, large corporations where people are afraid to move too fast because of, you know, you could have some disastrous results. So, slow going, you know, no building was on fire or anything like that, so they were able to take their time to really do this and make sure that they did it right. Another interesting case study from the, my General Motors experience, again done by not anybody on my organization, but again from their existing vendor community there in Detroit, three of the people that I had trained, two of them I believe had been certified to go solo and one of them had not, one of them was working for one of the other two uh, to climb the learning curve and the performance curve and you know get to the point to where they were two were ready to be certified. But uh, they used this whole methodology for curriculum architecture design again in General Motors it was called modular curriculum um, but they had a task their organization had a task to take four different manufacturing supervisor training efforts in different contexts in different manufacturing facilities where they were making different things um, and their these projects had already been started and they took a look at what the intended design was going to be for each of these four jobs and they went back in and redid it all redoing the analysis data and of course the analysis data that they had to fed those initial four efforts weren't anything at all like what we were teaching them to do and so they went back and redid the whole thing and where the organization had decided that they could share 11 courses across these four different training paths if you will training development paths learning paths um, Instead of only being able to share 11 courses, they were able to figure out how to save and share 78 courses across these four curricula. Now, 78 courses in a set of curricula, you know, a lot of these were, you know, more bite-sized, what we're beginning to call micro-learning nowadays. This concept has been around for a long, long time, so it was it was not new in 79 when I entered the business, but uh, we're, we keep on changing the names, and I guess we make everybody think that this is new and different, and we'll be better this time for sure, we promise. Um, but that's there was a savings of eight hundred thousand dollars from the original 1.4 million that was estimated to put these four sets of curricula in place so they were able to save 
you know, just all, just under uh, one third of that money to, <clears throat> because of the savings they were going to have here. Excuse me, that's uh, closer to one half. But anyway, so it was a huge number, and these were our projections, and who knows how it actually sorted out when all was said and done. But, but you could see the cost savings here because now you found a new way to reconfigure the content and take content that was shareable and do what I call bolting bookends onto generic content. Not that their content was generic, but it was generic across those four populations. Um, and of course, everybody the, of the four jobs, those contexts were different. So you could have a front end of the content that said, okay, here's our context, here's what you're gonna do with it, here's some examples of that, okay, ready, go, get into the training. And then at the end, we could swap out, you know, so we could swap out, you know, examples that were authentic for each of the four audiences. And, but anyway, that's, that's the game, plug and play, if you will, with content. And it's designed from the very get-go to facilitate plug and play to create derivatives. So if you created a set of content for one, the first of the four audiences, then you could do plug and play on the next three and save yourself a whole bunch of time and money for first costs which will also save you a ton of money for life cycle costs if you intend to maintain your content and keep it evergreen, up to date. Anyway, that's the game on that. So General Motors was a extremely interesting project. I, I talked in the video, uh, the previous video, about how that all ended. Uh, you know, we survived uh, the revolving door of General Motors University and the head person, and they finally brought in a fifth person after a few years. And that person came in and heard all the squabbling that was going on and decided to clear the decks and move all the existing vendors out and move all of the vendors that he had been using in his previous job, uh, where he was successful and successful enough to get this gig at General Motors. Um, but anyway, so that was, that was the story. We were all booted out of there at the same time. And it was a shame because I was very excited to see somebody embracing my methodology and internalizing it even though I didn't think that we needed to change all the terminology I was using, but that's what they felt that they needed to do, and perhaps they were right and I was wrong. Um, another project that uh, we did at uh, Caddy, that I did at Caddy, was for GTE. Um, this is, you know, part of the telephone system that is not AT&T. So in some of the rural and western areas of the United States, AT&T wasn't prevalent. They didn't, you know, own and run the telephony system somebody else did there's a lot of mom and pop telephone operators telephone system operators in our country at the time um, but this was uh, the next biggest uh, operator if you will GTE uh, GTE in the middle of this project became Verizon which is where GTE merged with uh, Bell Atlantic and a couple other Bell operating companies to form this new entity and so that's who we know as Verizon today. Can you hear me now? Um, so this project was for the wholesale bill billing call center people and what these people did for a living and there were uh, three locations where these people existed and these people were to scrutinize all of the billing records so that when somebody makes a telephone call from an AT&T part of the system that crosses into GTE or crosses through GTE into another so you have to figure out okay so we charge the client a buck fifty for this telephone call and fifty cents of this is ours and a dollar ten is somebody else's and the rest of the money goes to this other operator and so we got to keep track of all that and you can imagine there are millions of phone calls tens of millions of phone calls, I don't know, hundreds of millions of phone calls, I'm going to guess, per month that have to be accounted for. So somebody collected the money, and they owe the other parties. And every one of the parties collected money, and they owed the rest of them. So then there was this big reconciliation every month about who owes what. So, you know, I, you owe me $100 million, and I owe you... 50 million dollars and so you really owe me 50 million dollars and then the same thing with all the other parties and so you know there's a lot of you know this was big bucks this was high stakes and the organization that I found out I, they told me uh, was always worried that they were leaving money on the table that they weren't negotiating well enough because this was a negotiation because just because you tell me 
you know, I owe you this and you owe me this and this is how it nets out doesn't mean that I believe it. And so I'm going to push back and shove and try to, you know, get more money for my organization. And so that's what the nature of the job was. And the people in the job, you know, they had relationships now because they'd been working with these people in these other companies. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it became friendly. And so there was, you know, sometimes they were maybe perhaps a little lax with who owed who what and how that all shook out. And so anyway, the intent of the curriculum architecture design was to pro provide more rigor. Uh, we were building processes, formalizing processes that were somewhat informal in the organization through our performance analysis methodology. So you take the top people, the best people that you got, and they'll tell you how they do it. And that becomes the model for how everybody else is going to do it because we're going to train people to this new model. So that's what we did with that organization. And we did the curriculum architecture design. And then the people at GTE, who had now become Verizon in the middle of this whole effort, the training organization there, took the, the curriculum architecture design data, the design data, and went and implemented it. So they built out, they took the existing curricula that they had and reconfigured it and used some of it as is and some of it after modification. And one of the things I know that we did is we pointed out all these gaps where they had nothing. And so that had to be built or bought to plug into the overall training and development path. And there was a logical sequence for taking people from not knowing the job and how to do it to learning how to do it and ramping them up the learning curve and the performance curve in an accelerated manner because <clears throat> that's what this is all about. So that was a, a exciting project and uh, so one of the so the next thing that we worked on was a uh, our client now was now not GTE but they were Verizon and so Verizon came to us and said you know that was pretty cool some of our people had worked on that we heard about that there's a lot of eyes on this so what we have is we have an inbound, uh, call, some inbound sales call centers. We have seven of them across the country. Uh, again, most of these were, were GTE, and then there were some that were you know Bell Atlantic. And th these are the people that uh, take the field the calls that come in because somebody says, "Hey, I want to you know I want to know more about call waiting or call forwarding. You know, what do you got? What's it going to cost me? I think I want to add that, or I want to add a second line. I need a different phone. I need a princess phone for the kid." You know whatever and uh, so these people are highly regulated and how they open a call and what they say in the middle of the call and how they summarize the call before they write up your order and charge you on your next bill this is all highly regulated uh, public utility commissions state by state were the regulators which always means those regulations are going to vary so if i'm one of these people doing this and I'm talking to you and you're in Nevada uh, that's or in, in Utah that's going to be different than if I that if you're in Nevada or Wyoming or wherever and I had to read the script for that state because the calls coming in from that state make sure that you're not calling from some other state for your services that you need in another state because now that you know so that can get tricky right as people who live close to borders cross state lines and make may make a phone call uh, from some other location but anyway so they had to this was all very complicated and these organizations across the seven different regions had a total of 338 days of training that they were offering to these call center salespeople inbound sales uh, so you're not out there, you know, prospecting, but you should, you know, be saying, hey, I see you've got some kids, you know, do you need another line uh, for the, their use on the computer or, you know, they're teenagers or, you know, we've been gathering data and it's all in our computer system. So we know a little bit about these customers and I hear, you know, some kids in the background. So now I'm going to ask, so uh, have you thought about a second line so you can actually up the sale from when they come in? But you have to be trained to do that. And because there was a lot of money at stake. Um, but anyway, so we took across these seven regions, these were the seven locations where people were going to be going through in lockstep, cadres of folks going through the training all simultaneously and being put out on the floor to do these, the sales job. And so we took the 338 days of content and we reduced it to a total of 187. And of that 187 days, we designed 1,888 instructional activities. Again, training and development events are composed of 
uh, training and development lessons, which are composed of training and development instructional activities. So we were operating at that level, because that's where the detail is, the devil's in the detail, God and goodliness is in the detail. And so of those 1,800 plus content objects, 447 were shared, but, and 1,441 were unique because mostly of the regulators, because sometimes you couldn't bundle call forwarding and call waiting. Those were separate items and you had to price them separately. And in other locations, in other jurisdictions, those could be bundled and couldn't be separated. So <clears throat> it was, you know, very complex. And of course, they, people had their green screen computers in front of them where they could, you know, figure out for this state jurisdiction that I'm looking at, here's the deal, this is how this works, and I've been trained so I can handle this state versus the other states as well. So what we found though, even though that only 447 of the 1800 were shared, 75% of the eventual path was shared because the number of items does not equate to the length and duration of the instruction. So we were able to take these seven paths and if you looked at them really closely, there was a 75% overlap between all of them. And 25% were unique to their region and their public utility commissions, regulations, etc. So that was, um, um, uh, that I, I was extremely pleased with that particular project because this was demonstrating this shareability concept. And so as a result of this, we produced seven paths, but we actually produced eight because New York City as a financial center is a unique thing all to itself with different regulations than the rest of the state of New York. And so we actually produced eight paths for the learners. And then our organization was, was we, were, we do this from the very beginning. We we're gonna go from CAD to MCD. So we're gonna go from the architecture level of instructional design to the ADDIE kind of level of instructional design. And so we moved from the CAD right into the MCD uh, efforts and we designed all these um, uh, events and lessons and activities. Um, and our job was to take it to design. And then our client wanted to hand over all of our designs, which they were familiar with, to an e-learning company that they had found that they you know, really liked and they wanted them to have this particular assignment. And so the, the goal was to turn everything into e-learning. But we didn't have to change any of our methods because instructional events and lessons and activities doesn't matter what the deployment mechanism is because we're, we're kind of divorced from that. I've, I've tried very hard to make sure that, that my designs are robust to however you want to deploy it now. And when technology evolves and there's something new, you know, I need it to be robust to those future uh, uh, deployment mechanisms, if you will. And so that's what we were doing. Now, what happened is that another, uh, you know, this cyclical recession stuff happened and our client said, oh, okay, we can't afford to convert this all into e-learning because that's more expensive than converting into instructor-led training. So we're going to convert this in, we're going to take Guy's design, Guy and his team, because it was more than me that was working on this big, huge project. And we're going to build out the instructor-led training with this. And someday we'll come back and we'll convert this all to e-learning. I don't know if they ever did that or not because of the financial situations uh, that were going on at that time and for uh, a while afterwards. But anyway, so that was a very interesting project that, that demonstrated this shareability cons, uh, concept to a greater extent than I had had the pleasure of being involved with uh, previously. And so this was an exciting project. My last effort then with Verizon, the client was very excited about this and they heard about uh, how Guy's concept of instructional design is a subset of performance improvement. So my, my HPT, Human Performance Technology or Performance Technology or Performance Improvement or Human Performance Improvement methodology set is called EPI, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement. And by design, because I'd always had this in mind, I wanted analysts to learn how to do analysis for instructional purposes. But since those of us who've been in the business and are, you know, where some of us are acutely aware that instruction and knowledge and skill is needed for new hires, people new to the job. But if somebody comes to you with a performance problem, it's probably not solvable by instruction alone. So my saying that goes with this is that, you know, 
Training requests for new hires should be expected. Training requests for problem solving should be suspected. Um, and maybe training is part of the solution set for performance problems, but maybe you have to re-engineer the process or provide new information and data or tools, change your procedures, whatever. And then the instruction might be part of how you implement your real solution set, the, the solutions that are really going to make a difference. But if you just, you know, throw training at people, it's probably not going to change anything other than your expense profile. Um, so... <clears throat> The, um, so the the last project was for call center managers and we were going to do an epi project on that which means we were going to do the same kind of performance modeling we do for the instructional work but then when we instead of just simply de systematically deriving the enabling knowledge and skills we were systematically deriving all the other enablers so there's human enablers beyond awareness knowledge and skill like this like like the uh, intellectual capabilities attributes of people the physical attributes of people the psychological attributes of people you know if you're in a sales job you're gonna get a lot of rejection either you're psychologically fit to take a lot of rejection and wait till the average you know every 27th call you're gonna make a sale and so that's a long slog for some people and they can't deal with that but others can and so when you're selecting people before you train them this can be important but there's also the environmental enabler so do people have the right data and information and materials and tools uh, and tools is the consequence system adequate are the finances adequate so there's many variables that go beyond the human into the environment with with Deming called the system you know, if there's a problem, you know, most of the time, he said 94% of the time it's in the system, which is in the control of management and not in the individual. So some of us have learned, don't go train people to fix problems that they have nothing to do with. They're not the root cause. They're involved in it, yeah, they're visible, yeah, but it's really other things that are going on. So how do you tease all that out? So we had the project and we did the analysis meeting and then again, that recession hit and uh, the client in one we were there to read out the analysis data and to share it with them and on one day in the morning they got a budget cut a severe budget cut and they came and told us okay we're gonna have to do this project a little bit differently you slow it down stretch it out do something like that in the afternoon they got a second call and their budget had been cut so severely that that was the end of our project so we didn't get a chance to actually implement that project so but it showed great promise and the client had the analysis data and I hope that they went and did something with it. I lost contact with them because I was not their, the primary intermediate, uh, immediate person here who dealt with them from my organization. It was one of my other people that did that. Um, but anyway, so, so the, what, what's kind of unique about the, uh, or one of the aspects of my EPI methodology is that I took uh, what's known as the Ishikawa a diagram that came out of Japan in the 1950s in the quality movement in Japan and in in America it's often called the fishbone diagram or the cause and effect diagram but I adapted that the one that I had learned in 1981 at Motorola said every process is composed of four components and this is you know from the time 1981 but there's four things there's the men machines methods and uh, uh, let's see men machine methods and uh, now I'm forgetting the other part. Um, but uh, so I took that and divided that into what I call my epi fishbone. Uh, methods, materials, machinery. Yeah, so that was the other one. Um, but anyway, so uh, that's how we look at that. And when people look at that and they say, you know, when we want to understand process performance or any kind of performance, we're going to be looking for these variables. We're going to want to understand, you know, are there physical requirements? Do the performers have to have some physical capability? Stamina, physical strength, you know, great hearing, great eyesight, or what? You know, so what, you know, can we put people in wheelchairs or with other um, um, disabilities into some of these jobs? Because we shouldn't prohibit them from taking a job if what their issues are aren't necessary it don't have any impact on their ability to do the job so um, anyway that's that's what the epi methodology is about and I've not been really able to do too much with that other than write about it and write books about it and <clears throat> it's more of a pipe dream at this point here but uh, but what I but 
for the analysts who are analyzing performance for instructional purposes, they need to be on the lookout for when there's issues going on, barriers in the performance uh, context that instruction is not going to be able to deal with. And we need to be able to call these out to our clients so that they can attend to those things and put a critical action team or whatever they call those kinds of groups in there to fix these other issues here because if we simply upgrade and the training and you don't change the environment you're not going to get the results that you're hoping for and in fact perhaps you need to defer developing your training until you change the process and the tooling and the software or whatever are the root cause issues that you need to attend to first so <clears throat> anyway, so these things go hand in hand. It's something that I learned uh, from all my mentors, most of my mentors uh, coming out of NSPI, now ISPI, or the Total Quality Management Movement. Uh, the next client that I'd like to talk about is Bank of America. And Bank of America came to me and asked me to do a curriculum architecture for their retail branch personnel. And this included basically the tellers and the what they call the financial relationship managers, the people that are going to give you the loans and things like that and do more than the tellers do, even though there's a fair amount of overlap about what, some, what sometimes they're expected to be able to do. So the client had several, the, the client, Bank of America had done a whole bunch of uh, acquisitions. And so what they were faced with, this is when they were still out in San Francisco before they moved their headquarters to Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, because they, were, they too were acquired. Um, but the San Francisco group, so they had seven different sets of curricula for tellers and seven different sets of curricula for the financial relationship manager. And, uh, you know, this had been going on for years and they were maintaining this content and realizing that they were spending their money for maintenance seven times over. You know, there are state regulations that they got to contend with, so there's some things that need to be unique, but most of it was didn't have to be, but just was because of the situation. They had acquired that those other banks and those banking systems, and they acquired the people and the physical locations and the training that went with that. And so they were looking for an opportunity to uh, skinny down their expenses on maintaining all this curricula. So the, the, my contact, uh, Randy Kohout, came to my offices in, the, in the, uh, the western suburbs of Illinois and met with me, and uh, we started this work. And we had a very successful, so we did tellers first, and then we did the financial relationship managers. And... For the tellers, we had really good people, because my methodology requires on having you know the top master performers, and we're going to leverage what they know about the jobs, even though they can only tell us you know 30% or so, uh, because most of what they do is non-conscious. But we used this facilitated group process with a team of master performers and an analysis team and design team, and we designed a curricula. And I found out later, years later in fact, my client had already been to two other organizations <laughs> by the time he wrote a recommendation for me on LinkedIn and I found out that they had reduced turnover 30% in the teller ranks because they finally had a set of training that was focused on performance tasks and not on topics. Topics that all have face validity, oh yes, of course, yeah, people would need that. But those, the topic-oriented training never went that last mile to performance and help people learn how to perform back on the job. Um, which is unfortunate because that's the problem with most training when I entered the business in 1979 and it's still the problem today. We don't focus enough on performance, tasks, task orientation, but beyond tasks. We focus on topics and too much we're, we're expecting people to take the topic that we taught them, pass some knowledge test, and then go figure out how to apply it in their world. And if they struggle with it, you know, we should all know that they revert back to what they were doing before. I remember the Neil Rackham of Spin Selling fame working with some of my clients and he was asked the group of skeptical manufacturing operations managers, he said, do any of you guys play tennis or golf? And every last person in the room could nod their head and go, yep. And he goes, did you ever take any lessons? And they all nodded their heads, yep. And they didn't like this guy because he had this British accent. He was in a three-piece suit and he had a goatee. And there were manufacturing people. Hey, you know, this, this was a little unusual guy. What have you gotten us into? And Neil said, so the, the, when you got your coaching lessons, 
did they change your grip? This is a good example between tennis and golf. Of course, everybody's got a poor grip, so the, one of the first things the coach does, the teacher, the instructor does, is change your grip. He said, what happened to the ball? Oh, man, they all, okay, now they were talking. Okay, yeah, yeah, it went everywhere. Yeah, I couldn't, I had no control. That's right, you changed your behavior, so you lost control. So what is the job of a coach? And I remember Neil doing the pregnant pause, and I don't I would have gone and gotten a cup of coffee while they pondered my question to them. What do you mean, uh, you know, what? So, uh, so I, you lost control of the ball, so what did you do next? And they all had to think about it, and then somebody said, well, I went back to what worked. And he goes, exactly. So the job of a coach is not to, is to, is to reinforce the behaviors, the correct behaviors, uh, rather than focus on the results, because the ball's going to go everywhere. So what you really need to do as a coach is you need to reinforce the correct guy. Oh, guy, you, you slipped your grip there. Get back to the right grip here. You know, the ball control will come later. Let's just get the right grip down. And so eventually you use the right grip and eventually you get ball control and the results become self-reinforcing and guy will try to maintain the proper grip and not backslide to the old grip, which is what you do when it doesn't work for you. You go back to what worked, you know, as best as you could get it to work back before. And Neil then uh, uh, made this all more real. He pulls a little medieval flute out of his uh, pocket and he plays a little tune for us. It's, you know, very, you know, goes back, you know, you're thinking, okay, 14th century England, and this is with the music you might hear. And he stops and he says, you know, I'm not very good at this. Um, and uh, it's because my instructor tells me I don't raise my fingers high enough, and so I'll never really get good. I mean, I, yeah, I may sing good to you, but, you know, I don't sound good enough. I could sound much better if I had the proper behaviors. So I go and get instruction in this stuff, he said, and I, to raise my fingers appropriately so that I will, you know, get better and be able to improve. Otherwise, I'm limiting my ability to improve because of my own behaviors. And, uh, you know, uh, a couple of decades later, I asked Neil Rackham, when I was president of ISPI, to come in and do a keynote speech, and I, I asked him, I said, could you do that flute thing for the, you know, the assembled there at the, at the keynote? And uh, he did it, and I wish they'd recorded it, because it was, it's, it was so memorable, because he had my manufacturing operations managers, who prided on calling themselves the belt, fart, and scratch crowd, with this English gentleman, with this British accent, he had them eating out of the palm of his hand at that point. They were, they got it. They understood why we needed to have practice with feedback and we needed to take that from the classroom and get that out on the job and supervisors really needed to take a look at people's behaviors and focus on that. Not on the results, but shape the behaviors until the results are forthcoming and they will reinforce the correct behaviors but initially that ain't going to happen people are going to have lose but have ball control issues and they're going to revert back to their old behaviors and so all the time and effort and money you spent on training was for naught because we didn't reinforce it we didn't know how to maintain correct behaviors because you can learn them in the classroom and get out of the job and then start backsliding and i remember one example came up probably uh, after the 81 period, but maybe in 2004 when he did the keynote, is that, you know, Tiger Woods uh, uses a coach. Now, why do you think Tiger Woods needs a coach for his golf swing? I mean, isn't he like one of the top golfers? And so, but yet he uses a coach. Think about it. And I'll let you ponder that for a second while I turn the page here. Um, the next client that I'd like to talk about is a uh, company uh, Siemens Building Technologies. Now that's the more recent name, probably been there for 20 years now, but they were my one of my first clients back in 1983. I did my third curriculum architecture design project for them and I'd been doing a lot of work with them over the years and if you were to go back and look at my project list and client list you'd see them all over the place. MCC Powers was the original name and then they became Powers Land and Gear and a maybe a couple other names before they became Siemens Building Technologies, but this is HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and that's what they installed, and they grew from that to becoming building energy management specialists, where they were trying to control your energy bill by using smart technology to heat and cool and do refresh the air in your buildings. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> so the first CAD project was for their branch personnel. So these are the installers 
Um, uh, there were other jobs that we tackled later on, the branch manager position itself, the, the, the sales, uh, the technical sales person job. But anyway, so we, uh, we developed a, a, a bunch of performance tests uh, for them in a project, an initiative that they called time to performance. And the goal was to accelerate the time to performance capability. When can we get people to this you know, minimum standard of performance capability, whether it's sales or installation and you know, doing the job right the first time, every time, uh, and being more effective and more efficient with their performance uh, opportunities. And so the goal was to speed that all up because we can't have people climbing the learning curve slowly because it impacts our business. In fact, it could ruin our reputation in the marketplace if we have people who are learning on the job, trial and error, and things like that. Now that's trial and error, informal learning is okay for some things, but not for high stakes performance. We need more formal mechanisms to put in place, and it's not always a training class. It could be simply job aids that we gave people to guide their performance and get them on the uh, straight and narrow path for success. Um, but uh, so we did, uh, we developed performance tests for them, for their sales organization and for some of the other uh, jobs out in the branch world. Um, and this was all based on the work that uh, Ray, Karen, and I had done first at Prudhoe Bay um, up in Alaska in the Arctic Circle. Talked about this in the last video. And then seven years later in 94, we did this on the pipeline. But our clients were hearing about this because we're writing about this kind of stuff in our newsletters. And we got, they got, they asked us about this. And so we started working with them on this initiative. Uh, they are now using more of the learning path methodology, I believe, that came out uh, in the uh, early 2000s, but, the, but they were well versed in how to take a performance orientation to the analysis and design of curricula uh, in order to focus on performance, on tasks, and not on topics. And really, that's that's the big secret. Focus on the tasks and not on the topics. And when you're focused on tasks, please understand the terminal output that's produced and what the stakeholders require of both outputs and the tasks. Some regulators care about outputs only and they don't care about tasks. Other regulators care about tasks, not so much the outputs, um, and some care about both. So you've got to understand that about performance before you start building performance-based training and development. The next uh, client uh, was Eli Lilly. And Eli Lilly, the folks at Eli Lilly had been my client when they were all back at Amico in Houston. And I had worked with them and trained a bunch of the staff at Amico. And I was training folks at Eli Lilly because the head of training and a bunch of her lieutenants all moved in mass from Houston to Indianapolis, Indiana, much closer for me. Um, and uh, we started doing the same kind of a thing there. But they, so they used, they used their people for some things, but if it was really hot and key and critical and scary, they would bring us in to do those projects because um, their people were still climbing the learning curve and learning more and more as they got more and more experience doing this. But you still don't take somebody who's new to something and put them into some of these hot jobs. But uh, so I did a, a bunch of curriculum architecture designs for Eli Lilly. One of them was for leadership and management in 97. And then another was for district sales managers. That was my 69th curriculum architecture design project. I did that in 99. Um, and besides training a bunch of their staff in these methodologies. And there's a video of me online. Back in 1995, I delivered my 90 minute ISPI presentation to the HR and ISD staff at Eli Lilly. And uh, it's a video that's two hours and two minutes long, and it kind of explains the methodology, and it's kind of fun to look at that thing because I'm using the overhead projector and the overhead transparencies that you put on there one slide at a time, and I'd walk up to the screen and point out things, you know, old technology, but that's how it worked back in the day. The next client is Imperial Oil, a Canadian oil company, um, Esso Oil. And uh, we had done a I had done a curriculum architecture design for their their retail sites. So the gas stations basically that now sell gum and candy and a whole bunch of other kinds of things in the stores besides taking your money for gas. Funny thing is that that was one of my jobs 
back uh, in college after the Navy, and if you watch the very first video in the series, you would have heard the story about that and how that led me to getting into Wix Lumber and training and development and blah, blah, blah. But um, so that was a very interesting project. We did that. Our client won an ISPI award uh, for this. They had calculated a 540 to 1 ROI. Uh, they had returned $18 million because of this effort here. They had improved performance, that much, which meant they, they controlled expenses better and they had better retail sales and you net all that out and after their investment costs. Now, I did the Cricket Architecture Design. Uh, one of my staff members managed the development of the content post Curriculum Architecture Design. We hired a, a friend of mine who I had worked with at Motorola back in the day and he did the development of this thing and this was so successful that um, you know they continued to use us and we even used to help them write up their applications for their ISPI awards and they won a string of those and some of those projects involve uh, me and my staff. Um, I didn't work on every last one of these projects. You know, I had a staff of people that I had worked with to develop uh, more informally than formally, and they were doing a lot of this kind of work. Um, and so they did a lot of that, that, those projects. Another, pro another one of my clients was Bandag, and they were a tire retreader. They basically, and only did this on truck tires and not on car tires, but uh, so the the big 18 wheelers and all that stuff if you know you're driving along the road and you see you know parts of tires on the road you see you know what looked like it used to be the outside skin of a tire well that might have been a retreaded tire where the retreaded portion fell off and of course that's no good um but anyway so this client was interested in taking the theory of constraints uh kind of the gold rat uh, stuff that's in the that he talks about in his book the goal and this concept of drum buffer rope. <clears throat> anyway, it's basically how to organize your internal production process so that you have, you're doing things just in time, but with a safety stock. And uh, kind of controversial, uh, you know, people used to hoard safety, create their own safety stocks because they didn't want to run out of materials and everybody went to just in time. And sometimes that's problematic. What happens if something happens and now, you know, one station shuts down and then everybody after them has to shut down because they've run out of parts to work on. So, you know, part of this is a figuring out, you know, what, how much safety stock should we have in front of each operation so that, you know, should some operations stop for whatever reason, it doesn't stop everything. So this was the concept and this is what they wanted to do with their organization. And it also suggested that, you know, once you've made enough for the safety stock, you stop. You know, and maybe the smart thing to do with your your human assets that you're paying for is have them go out and paint the new stripes in the parking lot because that may have more value than you building up unnecessary stock because now you're increasing your uh, in process uh, material costs because you're building you're spending money on on stuff that you didn't really need and you spent your money prematurely and yeah you may be able to work that pile of of materials down eventually. But, you know, you got to bring more uh, logic to how you're going about doing that. But anyway, so we had, I had that project, which was really cool because I'd learned all about a drum buffer rope from the book The Goal, which I read one time and I listened to the audio cassette tapes two times on my back and forth drives from Chicagoland to the Detroit suburbs while I was working for General Motors. So I was familiar with the concept, and so that was an interesting project to work on. Um, the client, my client that I worked with there, uh, who wasn't part of the training organization, but was part of the materials group, as I re recall, uh, they were able to get everybody their, you know, what they had from their clients feedback from the training session is that one of them said, we were able to go back on the first day we were up and running at full speed and produce 30% more product at a 20% cost savings. Results elsewhere across their system were similar. So they saw a big impact here because we were focused on performance tasks and outputs using a success model that had been proven elsewhere and that's what we were doing. We weren't teaching them and lecturing to them on various topics that all had face validity, all seemed to be very relevant, but didn't actually teach you how to do the tasks to produce the outputs. 
It's the secret of performance-based training and development. Well, that's the extent of the, the clients uh, and projects that I wanted to talk about. And I wanted to talk a little bit about my, uh, my professional home, ISPI. I joined what was then NSPI, the National Society for Performance and Instruction, in 1979. In September, I went to my very first meeting. Uh, I met uh, uh, people like Frank Widra and Kathleen Whiteside and Erica Keeps and uh, 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 several others. And our speaker coming in was um, uh, Danny Langdon. And so I'm standing there before this all starts talking to Brian Desotels, who's telling me this story about, yeah, you know, this is September. We, we last time we met was in the spring. We take the summer off every year. And uh, the last speaker that was here, well, he was presenting stuff that was, you know, somebody took exception to it. So this guy named Frank Widra went and found a pair of scissors, rounded little kid scissors, and he cut the cord on the overhead projector. And he got a shock on that thing and it went <laughs> And then he said to everybody, because the lights went dim on the projector, he said, this is bullshit. Everybody, let's reconvene in the bar because they used to hold these things in our restaurant area so we'd have the rubber chicken dinner, hear the presentation, and then go to the bar afterwards and talk. So anyway, so he cut this guy off quickly. Well, I did not know this, but I heard this, this part of the story 30 years afterwards. Danny Langdon was the speaker that night. I didn't remember it because I didn't know any of these people. I was brand new to all of this stuff. And he heard... Brian telling me this story, and since he was the presenter, he was a little bit worried about Frank Widra, who was quite a character, the late Frank Widra, who was a good friend and uh, very much a proponent of this performance orientation and learner-controlled instruction. He wrote about this back in the uh, 70s, so none of that stuff is new. Um, but um, so, uh, but uh, so my, that was my entree into this organization, and I thought, how cool is that? They, because I was new, I have a radio TV film degree. I'm getting in the training department. I don't know very much about it. I've read the Bob Mager thing. I've learned about Ger Rumler and Gilbert stuff on, on the guidance, which is job aids, which is, you know, performance support nowadays. So, you know, I was a little bit concerned about my own competence. And, you know, how was I going to climb this learning curve and be successful? Because, you know, I was desirous of being successful and being competent. And uh, um, what I found... Uh, from that example was that there are people who are going to protect me from the BS. They're going to cut the damn cord and not let me see it. Now years later, Claude Lineberry and Bob Carlton used to play this game at the uh, NSPI and later on ISPI conferences. One of them would sit on one end of the audience and the other one would sit on the, on the left side and right side. And uh, <clears throat> They would intentionally go to sessions where they'd read in the program and said, well, you know, this is garbage. Let's go check this out. And at some point, one of them would stand up and yell so that everybody in the room could hear. I'm sorry, do you have any data on that? Which would then, you know, cause everybody to question, what is it that we just heard? Because here's this guy who is, you know, renowned in the society, challenging the speaker. And the other one of the two of them would stand up from the other end and go, stand up and yell, and data is plural. You know, no ends of one, no one example, no one-offs, we don't want to hear that here. Prove your point with data. Tell us about the research, or maybe it wasn't research, but the actual applications of this here and what your results have been. And so that was one of the things that I loved about NSPI is that I felt it helped me avoid the baloney and learn the good stuff, learn valid principles. Um, and as Dr. Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark has said, uh, and Jeannie Farrington said as they articulated a definition for what is human performance technology? Well, you know, there are things that have been proven to work or not work by research. But there's other things that seem to work, but nobody's done any research on it. And so we should embrace that knowing that it's not been proven in or out yet and so we might want to test these things because not everything that could be subject to research has been subject to research or enough research to really prove it in and out and to understand what, under what conditions does this work or not work. Um, but uh, so I valued what I learned from NSPI. <clears throat> I also have said for decades now, no organization has wasted more of my time 
than NSPI. However, no other organization has given me more back for my time than NSPI. So that's the quandary, is that, is that not everything is perfect. You can't go someplace and get, you know, everything perfectly, you know, so, but, uh, but I've been involved in projects within the society on various committees and things like that, where we did good work. We revamped the awards uh, program and made it go from a norm reference to criterion referenced, who would have thought, uh, so that everybody who meets the criteria wins the dang award. And it's not some beauty contest where we pick the, the best out of those that met the criteria. Um, which is what people were clamoring for. And I got burned on a, uh, I, I won a, uh, a second place, if you will, for a project that I had done. And I was told, well, you know, your client guy, AT&T, they won the big award last year. So, you know, we can't give it to them two years in a row. Well, that didn't sit well with me. So I made, made it a point to get on that committee and then work to revamp that. And I spent a couple of years, a whole bunch of my time and dollars getting that thing squared away. And then it was implemented, but I'm not too sure that whoever went and then implemented and then operated for the next several years didn't let it deteriorate a little bit. But so NSPI, which was the National Society for Performance, uh, Performance and Instruction, later became the National Society for Performance Improvement. They dropped the instruction. The, the late Joe Harless used to say back in the 80s, you know, saying performance and instruction is like saying the Department of Transportation and Bicycles. You know, because many of us appreciated the fact that instruction is not the key lever to improving performance. People got to know what to do, but most of the time they can kind of figure it out through informal learning means or whatever. Not everything is tricky or hard or, or critical. It's just necessary. And um, so eventually the organization changed the name from NSPI, meaning performance improvement, to the International Society for Performance Improvement because there was a clamoring across those who were non-North American, because NSPI was basically a, a North American-centric kind of an organization, so there were many folks from Canada and the U.S. that were involved, and people would come from Europe and Asia to attend some of the conferences, but, you know, they didn't find very many people from their neck of the woods within the organization, and they wanted to make the ch that change, so ISPI began to do that. But I became, so I joined in 1979, I was on committees, I I designed the, the conference logo for 1983 when they were bringing the conference to Detroit, even though I had moved to Illinois in the Chicagoland area and left the Detroit chapter, my home chapter. Um, and uh, I found it rewarding to really work on committees with people and really get to know them a little bit better. And this is, you know, we were doing telephone calls and face-to-face -face meetings for the most part back in the day. Um, but uh, so I ran to become a director of on the board in 99 and I, I was elected and I served two years. I was uh, there for when Dale Brethauer, one of my heroes, a good friend from college of my mentor, key mentor, Gary Rumler, and so I was able to serve with Dale, and that was huge. I mean, that was golden. And then I worked with uh, his president-elect, who became president after Dale left after one year, and that was John Swinney, a good friend. He's the guy at Band Egg. He's the one who got me into doing a bunch of work, uh, me, uh, both me and my other business partners over the years, at Band Egg. Um, and he had quite an interesting uh, uh set of projects that he worked on with Rumler and some of the other big gurus of the organization of, of the movement if you will and uh, <clears throat> so uh, Jim Hill and I were on the board at the same time and we were at a conference in Cincinnati must have been 99 or 2000 and he said guy I know you want to run for presidency but so do I so why don't we talk and decide amongst the two of us here who's gonna run when so that we don't run against each other uh, and I said, you know, I'm going to let you go first because I have this initiative that I want to start during my presidency. And it would really be great while you're the president-elect and president if you would help me get this initiative up and running so I'll have a two-year running start. Because after you run and win, I'll run, I hope to win, and then I'll have three years in order to have an impact on the organization. And the initiative became known as Clarifying HPT, Human Performance Technology, because one thing that I felt that was really unclear 
um, and was you know reinforced by the notion of there's we have uh, wards categories of instruction and non-instruction well the non-instruction is the department of transportation and the instruction is the bicycle so why can't we do a better job of articulating what the heck that non-instructional stuff is and that's what i wanted to do i was saying to people you know you can't go to ford motor company and try to sell them on hpt because they're going to tell you we got this Six Sigma thing here, so we're returning millions of dollars to the corporation. We've got this under control. Well, one is one point is that, hey, that Six Sigma stuff, yeah, Motorola, when they created that, they bought the intellectual property for from Gary Rumler to merge TQM tools into his process orientation. So Six Sigma is a part of HPT. But if you went around NSPI, ISPI back in those days and asked people, is Six Sigma part of HPT? Well, too many people see HPT as simply performance-based training and development or learning and development. And it's not. It's more than that. When you re-engineer a process, that's part of HPT. When you change the consequence system and the culture, that's HPT. You may use training and instruction as part of making those kinds of changes, but that's not the extent of it. So I wanted to broaden the tent, if you will. I wanted to have home rooms for people who were part of the instructional community, but they needed to also learn about the process stuff. Lean, Six Sigma, design of experiments, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of tools and techniques that engineers primarily use to affect performance. And training is sometimes involved, but it's not the big lever at all. And uh, that was proven by too many people that were in the society, so I thought I, this might catch on and be successful and help broaden it and broaden the appeal of ISPI as a professional society because you could come in here and go to your homeroom, learn even the latest and greatest and newest things about that domain, what Gary Rummler called technology domains. Now, so, so when Jim won, and I think Judy Hale was the president for Jim Hill, Judy let me actually start this on her watch. And I had called up Gary Rummler who, you know, I would joke with him, hey, you're screening your calls here because, you know, I leave my message and either you call me back or you pick up just before I hang up, leave my message. So you're screening your calls, aha, I caught you. And he goes, yeah, that's right, I am. And uh, I said, okay, so I got a big favor to ask of you. And uh, it's kind of a multi-layered uh, request. And Juan, you published this article back in 1983 it's 2002 now, so 19 years later. Uh, I'm referring to an article you published in the Performance Improvement Journal, or Performance and Instruction Journal, way back in the day here, and you talked about how to define performance technology, human performance technology. And you said, rather than try to write a paragraph or two about that, why don't we define it in terms of the technology domains? Now, technology means application of science and is you know, got something to do with computers, but that ain't it. So the application of science in motivation and incentives, that's that's could be a domain. Instructional technology could be a domain. Process technology could be a domain. Organizational development or organizational design or whatever you want to call that body of work could be a set of technology, the application of science. It's been proven by science to work under these conditions, blah, blah, blah. And he said, and I said, so I would like to use that article and start this initiative. And I explained the whole initiative to him. And I said, you know, it would really be helpful to me and this effort if you were to agree to participate in this with us and, you know, support us and, you know, cheerlead it on. And he said, you're effing crazy, but I'll do it. You know, and uh, he's... <laughs> because he had been frustrated for decades himself about the fact that we didn't seem to be able to move beyond instruction as the key thing that we were all talking about. And the society was composed of 60% of the members were from education and instruction training organizations. And uh, so how do you move forward and broaden that all out with, without dismissing them and their contributions? because um, that's where the organization really started with. The NSPI used to be the National Society for Programmed Instruction, you know, uh, computer-based training, if you will, on paper. Uh, short frames, not long frames, you know, all that kind of stuff that goes back, back to the uh, early uh, days of NSPI. Um, so he agreed to do that, so he and I co-authored an article about, you know, looking back and looking forward. Looking back was really about his article from 1983. Looking forward was about this, this effort 
this initiative that I had envisioned where I wanted it to be a society-wide effort. I wanted to gather about 20, 25 people, key people, renowned people in this, but not the same old, same old crowd of experts that you'd always expect. I'd have to have some of them, but I'd have to have some new blood in that. I wanted them to engage the rest of the society in reacting to what was brought out, what their ideas were on the front end, in the middle, and at the very end, and try to make this really a society-wide effort, very, something not easily done. Um, and what that resulted in is they, the group, the, the team that, that worked on this, decided not to call these home rooms, if you will, technology domains, Rumler's term, they called it PROCOMs, professional communities. And then we got a whole bunch of flack for trying to engineer top-down, you know, communities of practice. Well, this was similar but different, I think, but basically we wanted to have, it's like going to the library and there's the fiction section and the non-fiction section. And, you know, why did they have to do that, you know? Books are more than just fiction or, you know. So anyway, so the, that was the effort. That was my big, huge initiative. Um, it was not successfully implemented. There were many who didn't like it and kind of fought it. Um, and to me, it's a shame because I think that that uh, what is human performance technology or performance technology or performance improvement or whatever we end up calling this thing and let's pick something and then use, stick with that and market the heck out of it. Um, but we don't even really know what does it include and what does it not include. There's no agreement on that. And my thing is that, you know, that's a hard thing to market when you can't even decide what's in the box and what's not in the box. You can't describe its functionality and its potential benefits to people, you know, and what advantages it may have over other approaches. You can't do that. So it's a, a big shortcoming that I think has not, has yet to be fully addressed and, and resolved. A uh, big opportunity. But, uh, but again, ISPI is my home. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, um, I value tremendously all the people that I was exposed to there. You know, I got to meet the Gary Rummers later on. I met Tom Gilbert, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't have remembered that before he passed away. But uh, I became really friendly with, with Gary and uh, with uh, Bob Mager and with uh, Joe Harless. And uh, Bob Mager and I used to exchange emails until a few years ago. Now he's uh, 93 or 94 years old right now, so he may have uh, not be paying attention to his email every day like he used to. But he used to send me all the fiction books that he used to write afterwards. And so I always treasured those because he'd always have a nice note in them and all that stuff. But I met some really cool people that were really... Uh, at the vanguard of the movement of what they were calling the educational revolution, you know, because their real goal was not as much corporate America or corporations across the globe and trying to affect the training organizations within them. They wanted to go back earlier in people's uh, learning cycles. They wanted to go back and fix the education system in the U.S. of A. Um, and that's you know, they lament to this day, many of them, and you can read their laments going back into the 80s and 90s, that the fact that they were not able to actually get enough traction to do that. Now, the late Joe Harless had a big impact in his state of Georgia, and he got the Georgia governor and the legislator to back uh, an, an improvement initiative that uh, he was chartering and sponsoring and spent a lot of his own time and money on. Uh, but politics being what it was, when the next administration came in, all that stuff went out the door. So we seem to be incapable of learning and continuing good stuff for all sorts of nonsensical reasons. Anyway, that's enough about politics. During this time at uh, Caddy, uh, uh, 1997 to 2002, I published a whole bunch of articles in journals and magazines and things like that. So. Uh, I had published on Lean ISD, designing for the ISD life cycle, because I, uh, one of the things I think we pay too much attention to is simply first cost, first efforts, instead of considering the entire life cycle and all the maintenance, and are we designing and developing things to be easier to maintain over that life cycle, easier to create derivatives and share content with. Um, no, we don't. I uh, published uh, my book T and D systems view. Now I use T and D instead of L and D because I'm old school and I believe in training uh, because I take to heart uh, 
you know, learning to me is more akin to education. It never really necessarily always gets close enough. It does on some cases, yes. But it doesn't get to terminal performance, hands-on performance, uh, building outputs, just like in the real world work. And it does knowledge testing instead of performance testing. And that's its limitation. Now it can be part of the instructional strategy for sure, but too often that's all we do and we don't go that last mile to performance and that annoys me. So, but I use training and development because of a thing that Bob Mager told us, you know, he said, I'm tired of all these arguments about, you know, what's the difference between training and education? You know, you already know, let me prove it to you. One of your kids goes off to college and they write back to you and they say, you know, I'm taking a sex education course. Uh, you're probably okay with that. But if they'd written back and said, I'm taking a sex training course, you're probably going to be alarmed and you're not going to like that because you know the difference between education and training. See, I just proved it to all of you. He, he's done that several times at NSPI, ISPI conferences and keynote speeches. And so, yes. So I believe in training because I believe in performance-based training that prepares people for back on the job, for whatever those performance requirements are back on the job. And I believe training is a better label for that. And in fact, I think that instruction is a better umbrella label for everything that we do because sometimes we produce standalone job aids that aren't training yet their instruction instructing people on what to do when to do it how to do it depending on you know the nature of the tasks to be done and the format of the job aid but so that so we can do stand so under the umbrella term of instruction we can have standalone job aids or performance support and then we can also embed job aids and performance support into training because maybe we want to train the pilot on how to use that checklist as they inspect the airplane before they take off. Or do you think we can just give them the job aid and that will be sufficient? Well, wait a minute. That's high risk, high reward. Let's, let's make sure they know how to use that job aid and train them on it and what to look for exactly. And that's, that's better. So sometimes we embed these things into training. And sometimes we use training simply or we should use training when we simply want people to memorize things because there's going to be no time in the performance context for them to refer to anything. Your emergency medical technicians need to know what to do when it happens and confronts them. They don't have time to be looking up anything, the basic things. So we want them to be at the ready with that all the time. And we may have to do, you know, refresher, spaced learning, practice all the time to make sure that they won't forget things, that they really instill that in their memory and that it won't deteriorate over time. And there's other times when we want people to hone a skill. So we can't train welders generally using e-learning. We need to give them plenty of practice and feedback and more than one opportunity for practice and feedback to really hone the skill of welding. If you're welding the pipes on the Alaska pipeline, and leaks are devastating to the environment and to the people and to your ability to continue to own and operate that pipeline, well, maybe we should have them practice more than once. In fact, maybe we should do a little bit of overkill in the extreme with practice and feedback for some of these really critical things. Yeah, guy, I know you got, you seem to have gotten that last time. Let's just do it again one more time, just for grins. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, so, but that's, so the book of training and development systems view is about, you know, training organizations, learning and development organizations are more than their ADDIE or ADDIE equivalent or their SAM approach or whatever, you know, design thinking, you know, all this stuff now that we're using the newfangled stuff. Um, but it's more than that. And so if you were a manager of one of those functions, one of those departments, you need to take a broader perspective than just your instructional development processes and deployment processes. It's much more than that. So this book articulates 12 subsystems of a training and development system. And across those 12 subsystems are 47 processes. Now you have all those processes in your organizations, whether you like it or not, 47, yeah, it's a big number, too bad. Um, but you have them. And I'm not suggesting at all that every one of those be formally managed and gotten to a Six Sigma standpoint. No, you look at these 47 and decide, where are your, where's your pain points and which of these processes is central to your pain points? Go fix those processes. You don't have to fix them all. Some of them could be rather informal and they'll work just fine for you. 
in one company, but in another company, informal is not the way to go. So this is my approach to applying human performance technology or performance technology to the training and development function or learning development function, how to look at things from a process orientation. I'm very much a process oriented person. I was that way before I met people like Gary Rumler who are very much process oriented. And, uh, but anyway, so that's, that's the story behind that book. I made that book uh, available as a free PDF back in 2007 because I was never gonna become rich selling books, but I'd just soon give this away as part of my paying it forward as a way to pay back all these people at ISPI and from the TQM world that had a major impact on, on me and my practices, my consulting practices. So I had written that uh, other article on what is ISPI's value proposition looking back and forward, uh, co-authored with Gary Rumler, which was cool. I written on lean ISD and performance modeling for lean ISD and there's no such thing as communications, only miscommunications. Uh, the premise there is that you know, if I'm going to communicate to you, it behooves, it's on, the onus is on me to make sure that you got what I intended. And so there's, you know, different strategies and tactics for me to make sure that you got what I intended or for you to make sure that I got what you intended. And the premise is, is that communications is never perfect. There's always going to be errors in the interpretation. And so you just can't tell somebody something that's really critical and part of a high stakes performance one time and expect that to be sufficient. It is not going to be. So how can you go about minimizing the gap between ideal communications, which is interpreted correctly versus not so perfectly interpreted? I talked about, and I wrote about the HPT marketplace view, how that ISPI in particular should be looking at their marketplace and determining what products and services should the society render to the marketplace with a full understanding of who's out there competing with them for that. And so that they don't have to go head to head with somebody else that's got a great product or service out there, they can begin to fill the gaps between what isn't being addressed in the marketplace for professionals who are interested in performance improvement. My uh, Lean ISD book came out in 99. I'm going backwards in order in this thing here, as you'll see. Uh, performance modeling for Lean ISD, uh, something that I also wrote back in nine, uh, 98 as uh, part of my time at, at the Curriculum Architecture Design and Development Institute, CADDI, C-A-D-D-I. Presentations that I did, I did things on push-pull performance-based knowledge management systems. Sometimes we need to push things out because we need to make sure that guy knows what he's doing, no kidding, whether he wants, thinks it's important or not. We know that he needs to be competent and we need to assure ourselves of his competencies um, because he's in a critical process that has high stakes, high risk, high reward. Um, I presented and that it was at the ISPI conference and I've spoken on Lee and ISC a number of times, performance modeling, more push-pull uh, performance management, uh, knowledge management systems, curriculum architecture design, performance modeling, lean ISD workshop at the Golden Circle chapter in Des Moines, Iowa of ISPI, curriculum architecture design, performance modeling at the Kansas City ISPI chapter. You know, at this point in my life, I think I've delivered uh, 32 or 33 presentations to ISPI chapters since the first one on November 1st, 1982, um, trying to give back to my professional home that's given me so much and wasted a whole bunch of my time. Um, performance modeling, a training and development systems view, I presented on that, more curriculum architecture design, the PAC processes for performance modeling and analysis methodology at Western Michigan, ISPI chapter back in 99, some of these chapters no longer exist, performance modeling and knowledge and skill analysis and lean ISD at the ISPI conference, performance-based curriculum architecture design applications, so an overview of, you know, show your work, here's what we did on various job target audiences across many different client groups. You know, what does that look like? What's, what, what was the story behind the effort? Uh, lead ISD at the Lakewoods Training Conference in 98, et cetera, et cetera. And then there was the end of CADI. <clears throat> um, the, the end of CADI was really the result of us not being able to get through one of those mini recessions that something that I'd have been experiencing for 20 some years uh, at that point um, where we had a client who owed us $500,000 for 18 months 
and things, you know, and that was just one of our aging receivables as clients decided that, you know, they didn't really need to pay those invoices in, you know, net 30 or 60 or 90 or whatever, and, it, and, and this, was, this was a bad case. And it happened twice to us, approximately the same amount with the same client. And those kinds of things killed our cash flow, and basically that was the going to be the end of the business. Now, I had a staff of around 20 people and two partners at that time, and we just could not sustain ourselves through all of that. So that led to me shutting down the company, and I had a choice to make. And Ray Svensson had gone solo a couple years before, and he said, Guy, don't try to reconstitute your organization under the same name or some different name. You should go solo, and here's why I think you should. And I, I, I considered that, and then I made the decision that, yeah, that's probably what I need to do. I was watching many of my competitors with their staffs working out of their home, no central office, no huge overhead, much as I had. And uh, so I decided that I needed to change uh, because the world was changing on me and I needed to get with it and uh, approach this all differently. And I would use some of my staff and the consultants on my staff as projects came up. But that also meant, and I knew this was the downside of all that, that they would be looking for work elsewhere. And when I went to them to work with me and help me on a project, they may or may not be available. And so that was the huge issue. That's one of the things that drove me to increase the staff when I was working with Ray Svensson is that I needed to have control over the assets and make sure I knew what they were doing so that I could serve my customers. But I'd had too many instances where um, subcontractors, freelancers that I would hire would call me up just before they were due to start working with me and tell me that they couldn't because their current client had expanded their project and extended it and now they were no longer available to work with me. Well, that's not a good practice for them, quite frankly, because I would never go after them again, ever. Um, because if they made a commitment to me, I expected them to meet that commitment, but you know, that's not how the world always works, how we wish it would. Um, so, so I began my current firm, EPIC, E-P-P-I-C, the Enterprise Process Performance Improvement Consultancy Incorporated, and that'll be the topic of the next video, the fourth video in this series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, or The Insomnia Solution. Not my insomnia, yours. Just kidding. Stay smart, stay safe. Cheers.